Uh, you are now. Yes. And then full screen again. Oh, good. That's fine. Um, I'm assuming that was not the internet spewing me out of its mouth, so that's okay then. <laughs> I mean, God, did you did you happen to catch the question before you disappeared? No. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, no. So, Can we have it again? Yes. Um. So, do you have characters that will just go off in a place that you were not intending them to do, and do you like follow them and see where the plot goes, like let it grow organically, or do you like drag them back and be like, hey? No, here. Like, <laughs> but like, what do you do? Like, because I've had both happen. I, I, I've had them just kind of, and then I'm like, no, 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 no. I have a point I want to make. Stay here. So what do you do? Like, I don't have a plan, so I'm not invited to this party. Okay. <laughs> uh, 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 okay. So I'll, I'll I'll say, it's not so much. It's weird because uh, I know lots of writers. Actually, most of the writers that I know talk about talk about characters the way that you do, but my brain doesn't work that way ever because I, I hear that and I know exactly what you're talking about. But in my head I'm like, but I made all of them I'm the one making all the decisions for them. Like I don't I don't view characters as a separate entity. They're all things that are created in my head. Uh, however what I what the phenomenon you're talking about is as you're writing a scene and they're interacting with other people or interacting with an event, I've had times where I'm like, this plan that I've had for this person doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and I definitely have had characters vastly change over the course of a manuscript, where so much so that I had to go back and rewrite because I'm like, I, I got this wrong. Um, I have a character in my book, her name's Kaisha, and she initially started off sort of as a tertiary character, but now, I mean, she's in almost everything. And part of it was because she was written so strongly to have such cool opinions on things that I was like, I want to actually have her around more. So it wasn't that I, I realized that she was changing the story, is I realized she made it better. And that she provided a, a perspective that was lacking. Um, I had another character who I realized was basically a carbon copy of someone else in the book. So the way that changed is I removed them completely. Um, it just, I realized someone else served the same purpose within the story. So I was like, there's no reason to crowd the narrative with all of these people and have this expectation that people will be able to follow this many characters. So I ended up excising them completely. Over a lot of series, um, I've run into this problem. Uh, anybody who follows my Tumblr and looks at any discussion that contains the word muse will find a lot of my discussion on this subject. But briefly, I'm quite aware as a former psychiatric professional and you know present uh, herder of many unruly characters that when we're working, we split our brains up on purpose into many fractions, all of whose job is to get into arguments with each other. The more the merrier. It, it's about drama. Uh, Peaceful, quiet fiction, you know, by and large, doesn't sell. Uh, your audience comes to you for trouble, drama, and a quiet resolution, ideally, at, at the end of it. Someday, there will be something like what romance writers called HEA. There will be a happy ending, or at least a, an ending that makes sense for everyone involved. In the meantime, your characters or those segments of your personality that you have turned loose to be your characters, will get into discussions and arguments and you know fatal shit with each other, and that's fine, but when they start getting into those discussions with you, that's another story. I do not allow my characters to disrupt carefully constructed outlines without a good reason. <laughs> They get a fair hearing. They get to sit in a chair under the bright light, and they and I, because it's I all the way down, I know that, we have a conversation about what they think they can bring to this narrative and by you know, breaking over the traces this way. If they convince me, then it's good. I let them, like a cat, run a little ways, and then if they get too far or too far out of hand, the paw comes down, and we're done. <laughs> Characters with the baby... I kill. I'm God. I'm God. What else is it about? But if somebody gets up your nose, you kill them. You know, I'm a bit of an old test. I'm a bit of an old testament God in this regard. Now that's it. But they they get a chance to make their case. I will not, you know, knock them off stage without a chance for them to explain 
and to explain to me in the same idiom I use to build them what they're bringing to this carefully constructed narrative that I didn't see. Now, because they're all a bit of my head, I understand that my head will sometimes use symbolism and metaphor and other crap like that to talk to me. It's like, God, can you not just grow up and have a conversation? But sometimes that's the way it comes out. You have to give them a chance. But if they cannot make their case, if they're about disrupting shit and running around the landscape and, and destroying the plot that maybe you sold to a big high-end licensor for a large amount of money, let alone to you, then that's the point at which you say, bye, and you're done. You find a noble, worthy way for them to exit the stage, and you exit them. You know, maybe I'm just an old woman now. You know, maybe I'm just cranky. I, I can't cope with this shit anymore. Um, but at the end of the day, when you've built a lot of time, you spend a lot of time building a story carefully. We, we used the idiom a little earlier about one of those stick games where you pile the sticks up, you remove one stick, and the whole thing goes... You don't want one character that's feeling unusually entitled today blowing that whole thing out of the water. So you say, fine, stick, character, bye. <laughs> and, you're, and you're done. You know, you've got to be God sometimes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, go in the back here, and we'll go to Mr. James. Yes. Okay. Um, I have this issue sometimes. I think it's related to writer's block, but like I look at like the sense or so I've written, I've gone and I go, what I'm writing is crap. I can't keep going, even though I have an idea in my head of how it goes. I look at my prose, the prose itself, and I go, this reads like garbage, I can't keep writing this garbage because it looks like garbage. Right. It's and, then, and then I stop and like I know intellectually it doesn't matter if it's good, just write it, but I'm too perfectionist to mm. be able mm. to not edit on the go. Mm. It's the job we of... We all nod. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're having like... It is the job is. of the first draft to be crap. The first draft is there to exist because you can't fix what isn't there. You know, I can I can talk forever about what a beautiful scarf I would knit if I ever learned how to knit, but since I've never picked up a pair of knitting needles, that scarf is never going to be real. You have to write a bad first draft because then you can unravel it and write a good one. Uh, my first book, I rewrote completely, as in retyped from the first word, more than 17 times before it was sold. I spent 10 years learning how to write books by rewriting the same book. And I'm pretty sure that the first six drafts were just made of shit. They were actually feces on a page. <laughs> But you make it better by doing it at all. I, I understand the perfectionism. I used to have the same problem. I would write half a page and then go back and rewrite that half a page and just keep doing that over and over. And there's a certain point at which that turns into either self-flagellation or masturbation, depending on what you're doing. <laughs> you're not going to move forward. So I get perfectionism. I get obsession. I really, really do. But you got to tamp it down and just keep moving. Don't let yourself look back. Um, I think that may have been easier in the typewriter days because I could literally take the pages mm -hmm. I had finished that I wanted to revise and put them in a different room. And then my reward for finishing would be that I could have them back. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a solution for you. Go to a Goodwill and buy yourself a crappy old typewriter. You know, something. Um, but, but you have to move forward. You're never, ever going to get better if you just keep treading water. Um, I can give you two pieces of advice as well because I was the same way. It was, it's, and it's really hard reading your own prose because then you read someone else's and you're like, how do they do that? I don't understand. Um, so one of the things, uh, Scrivener has been a big help, especially because you can, your brain is telling you that, that this passage is not written well. Sometimes you can't figure out what it is, but you know it's wrong. And so Scrivener will allow you to highlight text. And so I used a color 
for each document. Each chapter was in its own folder, so I could leave that document and not have to go back to it nice. and see it while I'm writing. Um, and so I would highlight it and then just keep writing. And that was my way. And I would do obnoxious red or pink or something bright so that at least my brain was satisfied of saying, this is terrible. Remember that this is terrible. You could come back to it later, at least when you're doing a second draft. This is the things that you need to pay attention to. Another problem I had was that I couldn't identify why I hated a sentence so much or why I hated this thing. And that was where um, – uh, why this advice that uh, Sean is giving is so important because another person will be able to figure it out in a second and they will mm -hmm. tell you and it is it is actually very freeing to find out what your flaws are very specifically for me I didn't notice that I did this and now I can't even look at them anymore um, my first or it was the one draft that I gave to everyone was actually my third uh, almost entirely rewritten from the first draft so it was my third draft that I finally gave to a bunch of people um, I hate adverbs now because I didn't realize I used them every other goddamn word. Um, and it was something that I didn't realize that this was a specific thing that I had relied on in the text. But once someone told me, I realized that was most of the sentences where I was like, something is wrong here. I don't know what it is, and I want to keep rewriting it. It's because I never had someone just say, stop fucking using adverbs. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I just... I'm pretty that, sure she's heard that word before. Yeah. Um, if, yeah. I know so she's if heard it would be true. Yeah. This is that's Ireland. Why, that's why the, the act of letting it go and accepting it's terrible is so important mm -hmm. because you ultimately want to find out why it's terrible. And you're not going to know in your own head sitting there rereading the same. You're not going to know what that flaw is. And then once you do, you're like, oh, now I know how so I can approach obvious. this. Well, yeah. that too. Yeah. The man upstairs, by whom I mean my husband, who is across the road right now, is really a, a poster boy for this particular problem. He is the proof of whose proverb was it, Balzac of Voltaire, I forget, that it takes two people to make a masterpiece. One to write it, and one to come up behind them and hit them in the head with a hammer when they're done. Uh -huh. And in particular, Peter has... The research vice. It's like, oh, God, would you ever fucking stop researching? Fill in the blank. Whatever you like, he's researched it. I'm going, stop doing that now, but also stop rewriting that page. You've rewritten that page five times since I was in here last. Cut it the hell out. Some of his best writing. Once upon a time, he was finishing a book called The Golden Horde. It was the third in the Prince Ivan series, in which he had taken the, the folk tale of Prince Ivan, the fire, Firebird, and the Grey Wolf, and expanded them as epic fantasy. And they're bloody brilliant. I don't want to have to tell you how much time he spent studying Russian, just for the writing of this. And as he's been revising the e-books for this, I must tell you, he's been taking all the Russian out. And he, you know, I look at him and I say, honey, what is this all about? He says, it slows the reader down. And I'm going, thank you, God. <laughs> it's the thing, you know, it's a problem when you're actually married, you know, or partnered to another writer. There are things you don't dare say mm -hmm. because either it's a problem that you conquered long ago and they haven't yet come to terms with or it's a problem that they have come to terms with and you haven't. And the minute you open your mouth, you're doomed. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's over there. That's um, a whole different level. But in, in particular, the rewrite thing, he's got four typewriters upstairs, four of them. They use paper. He actually only uses one, but he does it to get away from the too easy revisability of the screen. And he got this from Neil Gaiman. Neil, Neil also got him onto the fountain pens, and I've got to talk to Neil about that. It's a problem. <laughs> but uh, he's gotten to handwriting his drafts again, and it must be said that his writing is flowing more smoothly since he started handwriting. And then he transcribes the screen. So, you know, I owe Neil one anyway, but what the hell? Which, which actually brings me to one other thing I wanted to note. Everyone's brain works differently. And if you're trying to force your brain into either a writing medium or a writing time that does not work for you, you're going to have problems. Um, one of my best friends mm -hmm. is an author named Catherine Valenti, and she is 
a hardcore night person. Like when I'm at her house, it will hit 11 o'clock at night and I'm like, I have to go to bed. Everything is made of wasps. She's just and, started. And yeah, and she's like, oh, she's start just my starting work day. Um, when I was in college and I had morning classes, so I couldn't be writing in the morning, I would be writing at like midnight and I would produce yeah. sentences that, <laughs> wow, uh, one of them that I actually committed to memory because I could not believe I had written it till I checked with a friend was it descended with the pendulous slowness of stone. Yeah, the next morning I revised that to it fell. <laughs> because that that's not me. That's me drunk on fatigue toxins. I'm a morning person. I get up at 7 a.m. I'm at my keyboard at 7.30. You know, I'll take internet breaks throughout the day, but I'm, I'm usually done working by about one or two, because about one or two is when my brain starts going, kittens are nice. <laughs> I would like to build a house of kittens. <laughs> and my writing really suffers once I want to live in a house of kittens. <laughs> um, so, you know, figure, figure out. You may have other commitments, a job, school, whatever, that keeps you from writing at what your brain's optimal writing time is, but then find that time and use that as your revision on the weekends. If you think best from 9 a.m. to noon, that's when you revise on Sundays. And that way you don't have to worry that it's crap when you're producing it the rest of the week because you know you will be going back to it with your best brain to fix it. And that can be a big, big help. It's true. Learn your time. Peter's time is midnight to 6 a.m. Mine is anything after the sun rises until about four in the afternoon. And then in the evening we fraternize and then, you know, the circle yeah. starts again. <laughs> but trying to force one party or the other into a cycle that isn't theirs. Yeah. And you got to find your own. It can be the time you're in the cafe, mm -hmm. you know, whenever that is for you. It could be lunchtime. Cat becomes a um, girl from the grudge if you try to make her work in the morning. Uh, I actually turn so into awesome. Wind Whistler from My Little Pony, the original, and I'm just a cheerfully murdered. <laughs> <laughs> I don't kidding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course. This kind of calls from the last question, actually. Um, when working on like a manuscript, um, I thought it's really easy to just sort of keep telling yourself, okay, it needs another round of revisions before it's, you know, really good enough, or it needs another round after this and another round after that. How do you, like, get to the point where you just tell yourself, okay, this is done, this is finished, I'm going to, you know, send it on and get other people looking at it. Just, like, not, like, it, it, how, how do you convince yourself that something is done? Because it's always so easy to feel like there's, you know, yet more that can be done with it. I don't think I've written something without a contractual deadline in the last five years. So there you go. I, I don't get paid if I miss my deadline. And also OCD again, if I miss a deadline, I think I will actually die. Like I've never missed one. So I'm yeah. pretty sure I will just drop dead. Uh, for me, since I, since I can answer this without uh, uh, deadlines, is the point I knew I was done with it was when what I saw is the major issues were resolved. And major, I mean the plot issues, character issues, and my big thing was pacing. Um, mm -hmm. my first, the first three drafts of my novel had a pacing issue where I, I was missing a story beat at the beginning, and the setup was too long until the action started. And then once the action started, it was fairly relentless, but a lot of the people who read it were just like, it needs, there's too much of a gap here. Um, and so once I found that the story issues were done, that was when I felt closer to feeling it was done. Because I knew once I started giving it to people, and once I go through you know, actual editing process, they'll fix all the other shit. You know, um, for me it was, I, does the story make me feel good? Do I feel excited about it? Do I think this is something someone else will read? I mean, that's like the bare minimum, and then, then I'm, I'm, it's done, you know. It's going to go through other revisions. It's going to go through de many different forms, I know that. But uh, I think for me it was, it was if, if I felt just a base level satisfied with it, then I knew I could hand it off to other people. It depends on where you're working. If you're working in television, then yeah, those deadlines are stone. You do not get to mess with those. Um, and I can't tell you the feeling of complete valediction, and not valediction, excuse me, validation, um, that you get. You've turned a piece of work in, and then someone else messes it up, and you 
have to come in and fix it again. And everyone's going, I'm so sorry. It was so perfect when it came from you. And now it has to be repaired. Uh, I did that on a miniseries once. Uh, some of you will have seen on sci-fi a thing called, God, what are they calling it now? Um, uh, it has had many names. In the UK, it was called Sword of Xanton. It was called The Ring in Germany. Oh, excuse me. Um, oh, God. Uh, I can't remember the name of my own miniseries. I feel stupid now. Uh, in any case, Peter and I did this for the production company in, in Germany. It went to sci-fi. Uh, Dark Kingdom, the Dragon King. That was it. So that thing, yeah, we wrote that. And the, the heart of it was we, we you know, had a nice director once upon a time, and then he got the hots and went off and filmed Troy instead. And we wound up with a German director who was very gifted in his way, who had written a thing called, last, excuse me, directed uh, Last Exit to Brooklyn. Uh, but he took the complete, beautiful script we had turned in on time, because, you know, we would have slid our own throats rather than be like, you just don't do that. You don't do that to your co-production partners. We turned it in. This guy took it away, didn't like it, rewrote it for certain values of rewrote. Because here is this amazing thing, a director who does not understand script format. So he actually hired someone to, he took, this poor schlub that he hired took dictation. He turned in this revised thing to the producers. And the producers called us. We had just come back, having you know spent a, a good little bit of our turn-in payment on a lovely two-week holiday holiday in Leukerbad in Switzerland, and we were rested. I was ready to go on with the next book. Life looked good, and I got a call from the producer, and she said, "You know what? He's destroyed your script. We don't have you under contract for this. We cannot do anything but ask you. Will you do this? Will you please come and fix what he broke?" <laughs> because it was perfect when you turned it in. And I mm, got off the phone. Uh, Peter and I flipped a coin. I lost. I had to go. <laughs> <laughs> and the really good thing about this, the really good thing about this was the director, when he was told that one of the writers was going to come back in and put this thing right, he said, oh, please tell me it's not Diane. <laughs> He had no idea what he was in for. He really wanted it to be, because he figured he could roll over Peter. He knew that Peter did not have that much time doing screenwriting. And so then ensued two weeks of me sitting there in an unair conditioned aircraft hangar in L.A. where the, the uh, special effects people, um, Uncharted Territory, who later did Godzilla and a few other things, um, had their offices. They were subletting space from them. I got to sit across from my proper producer, who's an old friend of mine, and just sit there and rewrite their script day by day, passing it in through the hatch. And then every three days, there would be a meeting in the, in the director's office that consisted largely of screaming <laughs> as he had to just, you know, take what was being given back to him. There are moments when you feel so virtuous because you turned it in on time and then this other asshole, you know, <laughs> did this terrible thing to it, which you then had to fix. And then think the fixed thing then goes, gets shot. Wonderful people are in it. Um, it wins awards in Germany and it's sci-fi. It turns up at Christmas all the time. And people go, why? Because everyone dies horribly, you know. Uh, it is Siegfried and Brunhilde and the dragon and all the rest of it. They're all there. We left the Wagner out. They, they asked us specifically to leave the Wagner out. We said, cool, no problem. Let's go back to the Nibelungen lead as it was. And it's a magic thing. Yet, you know, every time I see it now, I see I turned it in. I was virtuous. We went away. And then all this shit happened. And we still won. Somehow. Every now and then one turns out like that. And, the, mission, and the, the, the message is always turn in on time because at least you are virtuous and innocent. Yeah. 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 Do we have time for one more? Or for as long as that lasts. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just wondering what the three of you thought as career writers, um, if there was any difference between someone who 
start to remain out of their own homes on their own time without that much formal training versus people who, you know, will swear by this program or that program and the MS. Oh. Did you hear that, Diane? Uh, he was just wondering, uh, could you repeat? Yeah, he, he was just wondering, as career writers, what do we think of people who start on their own time out of their own homes without formal training versus people who, I'm, I'm looking at him to make sure I'm getting the question right, versus people who have done uh, programs, writing workshops, or gotten an MFA, something of that. Basically, the, the untrained versus the trained. Do we have an opinion? Well, I mean, I dropped out of college and I'm doing pretty well. So same that's, here. That's pretty awesome. Um, you know, I I'm learning everything the hard way. I know that. I know mm -hmm. that I'm learning it by making constant mistakes and figuring out how to do this. Uh, but it's also super rewarding and validating. I I you know I also have friends who've done like Clarion, and I kind of want to because I never got formal training, mm -hmm. and I feel like I don't you know I feel like. It might be a nice tool, but then I'm like, but I could use that six weeks to just write another book. Like, right. So I don't know. I, I, I would have to get to a point where I had lots of money and free time, which I don't foresee for the next 100 years. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, it works for some people. They need the structure. They mm -hmm. need that sort of format to learn. But I've been, learn, you know, doing this. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. That, that's kind of where I am, too. I, I also dropped – I ran out of, out of money, so I didn't finish college. Um, I actually went from college to phone sex to technical support to process engineering to being a full-time writer. So, like, everything is weird. Um, I also I, – I think that we put too much stress on one true way, that yeah. there is a way to do it, and if you do it this way, you'll get it right. Um, you mentioned Clarion. Yeah. I know a lot of people that have gone to Clarion over the years, and I find that Clarion graduates come in one of three flavors. Drastically improved by Clarion, really ready to face the business, broken utterly by Clarion, probably released maybe one or two more stories in their career, and those were what they were workshopping at Clarion because they are now so insecure about every sentence that they, they can't find themselves anymore. And... Well, Clarion has taught me that I'm not a writer. And we hear mostly from that first group. And I think that as Clarion goes on and more and more graduates have spoken about their experiences, that we're self-selecting. People who know that they would be in category two or three are getting better about not going to Clarion. But if you're the kind of person that doesn't do well under that kind of pressure, you know, congrats, you have just paid to literally have your psyche shattered. It's not good. So there is no one way. There's no right path. If you don't think that sitting in a room with me and having me tell you that everything you do is awful for six weeks would be good for you, then, then don't do that. That's a bad plan. Any plan where that happens is bad. But I, I mean, I had the same journey, too. I dropped out of college because I ran out of money. Were you in phone sex after uh, that? No, I worked as a the web designer of, for an escort agency. So, <laughs> and, then, the <laughs> uh, and then, and then worked at uh, pretty much the same thing, Ticketmaster for a year. So, it's, it's, it's the same. But I took a very weird path mm -hmm. to minimum wage jobs, things that had nothing to do with writing. And it wasn't until I got the job at this company called Buzznet, which is where the Mark Reads reviews started where this company was like, hey, you can put together words. Why don't you just start writing things? Mm -hmm. um, and that was what enabled me to finally feel like I was in a place where I could start experimenting and start writing every single day. So it was, it was um, I don't know, I always hear that this is, like you said, there is one way to do it. You got to yeah. go through college. You got to get your MFA. I was an English major when I started college. I lasted one and a half semesters before I was like, this is the worst. It was horrible. I hated it. Um, it made me dislike reading and dislike mm -hmm. writing and it sucks but I mean I got to come back to reading and writing yeah. on my own terms and I appreciate that yes it's harder yes it sucks to not know if you're gonna be able to pay your bills or if you're gonna be able to pay off debt or any of these things that come with not having the structure but at the same time like I'm getting to do something that I love yeah. all the time and as much stress and pain as it causes like it's it's pretty fucking awesome. I mean, look, look at this shit <laughs> I don't know if you know this this is awesome after you answer there I have there's something I want to tell you after you answer before we disconnect. So, Okay, coolness. Um, I have no training. Um, I have, like, high school. I have what you learn in high school. Um, I more or less dozed through my English classes until uh, they came up with Shakespeare. 
for some reason or another, Shakespeare resonated. And I started going, oh, all right, yeah, yeah. Now, bearing in mind that all that time I had been writing since I was eight, um, I wrote my first novel like with crayons and, and stuff. And I thought you had to do all the illustrations yourself. Gee, what a strange thing. I'm still doing that. And when I started actually doing school visits, it charmed me to hear the same question from kindergarten kids. This is in the pre-printer time that I had had originally if, if a writer had walked in to my you know, kindergarten class and said, hi there, I'm a writer, my first question would have been, how do you write so small? <laughs> oh, she froze again. But what a cute freeze. <laughs> Come back. Hail all of Shakespeare. I inhaled Shakespeare, and then I went to college for a year at the point where I realized that, you know, I had this idea. I won a New York State Regents Science and Nursing Scholarship. And so my first thought was astrophysics. Yes. And I went and started the astrophysics program and I hit calculus and I bounced so high <laughs> that I'm sure I could be seen from orbit at that point. So I said, all right, fine. This is not working. The science half, at least, you know, in, in terms of this isn't working. I'll go do the nursing part. And it became the psychiatric nursing part. And that turns out to have been some of the best homework any human being can do for being a writer. Because all of good psychiatric nursing, we are now led to look down on the talking therapies. You know, uh, well, bullshit to that. The talking therapies are really, after the drugs, the only ones that count. Um, you learn motivation. You learn why people do the things they do. You learn the reasons they tell themselves in their heads or find in their heads for the things they do. And you bring that knowledge to your writing and stuff happens. Um, you know, I wrote through nursing school and I wrote in the first couple of years when I was practicing psychiatric nursing in New York. And then I fell in with David Gerald and, and, you know, having worked as his assistant for a year or so, I realized, you know, you could actually do this for a living. I mean, you could write, you could write for a living, my God. And so I wrote my first novel and he said, fine, I'll show this to my editor. Let's see if he wants to buy it. And they bought it two weeks later. That's the door into fire. Um, that is my career trajectory. I have no training except what I read. And so that's why I read all the time stuff I think will interest me, stuff I think won't interest me, because that is the way, that's the sneaky way that God puts the tools in your hands. I'm convinced of this. You go out of your way to seek out. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I see that. You go out of your way to seek out the stuff that you think will be of no possible use to you, and then you find suddenly, a month from now, two months, three months, that that's exactly the thing you needed. So you just sort of go out in, in the street, hold a bowl out and say, God, send me what I need. And then you go inside and write from whatever falls into the bowl. I speak metaphorically, obviously. I just being Ireland, something always falls in the bowl and it's usually water. <laughs> but anyway. So, you had a thing you, had a thing um, you wanted to I think we're actually out of time. Five minutes. Okay. Um, so I mentioned that I, I did phone sex out of college uh, for a couple of years. For okay. you who are too young to remember this as an industry, there was a time when pictures did not travel well over the internet. <laughs> so when folks were looking for pornography, they would pick up the phone. And um, a good phone sex line usually had assigned categories, you know, things that people did well, that they were good at improvising, and then you'd have a concierge whose job it was to help the people with more unusual requests find someone that could assist mm. them. Um, and we, I got a call one night as I was finishing another call from our concierge. Of course I'm going to tell her this! <laughs> <laughs> Why would I not? I just remember what it is. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I got a call one night from our okay. concierge, and um, she says, okay, you're the fifth person I've tried. If you can't help me, 
um, I'm going to have to tell this gentleman that he needs to call another service. So I'm hoping that you can help, but, but don't feel any pressure. And I said, okay, what is it? And uh, this was, again, a while ago. So My Little Pony Friendship is Magic was not a thing yet. And uh, there was a gentleman on the line who really wanted to have a phone sex experience with Megan as an adult from My Little Pony. Okay. Um, All right. So I went, my time has come. <laughs> but you need to give me about 30 seconds to get into the voice, started singing verses of There's Always Another Rainbow, and then had a three-and-a-half-hour phone sex call. So thank you for helping me with that. I got a large phone call. It's, it's, it's entirely a pleasure. It has to be said, I'll, let me just add briefly, that I only work with them briefly. Right. Um, I did one script. Yeah, one episode. I did one script for them, the name of which is eluding me at the moment. It was a re it was the great it was a retelling. <laughs> Thank you. It's a retelling, obviously, of O. Henry's um, classic story, um, the name of which has just fallen out of my head, uh, where they kidnapped the little brother and, and he's too much for them. And, you know, the ransom of Red Chief. Thank God. Um, this is what you do. You know, when you're writing animation, there are days when you come up empty. And you say, I know, I will retell the random, the ransom of Red Chief and it'll be okay. Oh, you know, and these things <laughs> bounce back and forth. <laughs> these things bounce back and forth in the universe until here you and I are. And, and you know, life is bizarre, but life it's also interesting. You know, but in a good way. I, you know, doesn't bother me. It was honest work. My check cleared. I assume yours did too. Oh yeah. <laughs> he paid five dollars a minute for three and a half hours. Wow. I think that's the most per word I've ever gotten paid. That is what I call. That's an honest day's work. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, sounds good to me. Yeah. Thank you very much for, you, for having a conversation with us. It's a pleasure, guys. Are you kidding? Hey. <laughs> bye bye, guys. See you later. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Catch you later. <laughs>